Good evening, but also good morning. And I think it's fitting that we find ourselves in different time zones for this event because the starting point for this event is a story of time travel. It's the story of Outlander, which if you haven't watched it, is about a Second World War nurse who um, finds herself in um, Scotland just after the Second World War, 1945, and goes back in time to 1745 to Scotland and then onwards to North Carolina. Um, so it's a story of time, time travel and in season four of Outlander entitled Brave the New World, there is an encounter with um, Native Americans set round about the 1770s, but again with a time travelling aspect to it because part of it is a story of a, a, someone who's travelled back from the United States in, in the late 1960s to the 1770s Na Native American called Otter Tooth. So that's the starting point because in June 1918 there was a remarkable event. A hundred First Nation a, a actors from Canada arrived in Scotland to take part in season four of Outlander. And this was remarkable for, for different reasons. I mean, because of a Screen Actors Guild restriction, they could not be from the United States because Outlander is filmed in its entirety in Scotland. So they recreated North Carolina and the Scottish Highlands. But it was remarkable for another reason because 130 years earlier, another group of performers Native American captors had arrived in, 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 in Scotland under very different circumstances with quite a tragic face to their, to their arrival as part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And among the many compl complex stories and anecdotes and vignettes about Buffalo Bill's three month stint in Glasgow in Glasgow's East End from November to February 1891 to 1892 was the fact that one of the the the, the entourage George C. Crager and a Lakota interpreter bequeathed, donated or sold some items that he had brought with him across the Atlantic. And among those items was the ghost stand shirt, which hung in Kelvin Grove Museum for a hundred years before being repatriated in 1999. And that in some ways was the end of one kind of story, but it's a story that still, as we'll see this evening, um, to, to, to be fully told and, and still has elements to it that were not 100% aware of yet. And even just to give one example, a lot of photographs were taken during Buffalo Bill's two visits to Glasgow. And we have some of those photographs, but we know there are, we know from correspondence that there are a lot of photographs that have still to surface. We'll show some of those images this evening, but they're definitely still out there in family collections and boxes somewhere. There are still a, a further images. So the format for this evening is we do have a panel, a distinguished panel, and I'll, I'll get them to introduce themselves in a moment or two. And we also have some interviewees um, that, that we'll show clips of. These are, these are ones we made earlier, as it were, who are going to be part of this film. And before I go any further, I would just like to mention two of those uh, uh, interviewees. One of them is Tom Cunningham. And Tom Cunningham is the author of this book, Your Father's the Ghost. Buffalo Bills, Wild West in Scotland. And although Tom would say that he would, he would revise and, 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 and change aspects of this now in light of new information, I think this is really quite a remarkable a, a study of Buffalo Bills, two um, hugely significant visits to, to, to Glasgow and to Scotland. And the other book I would like to mention is this book by Tom Bryan. And it's a book called Two Tribes. And Two Tribes is about Scottish and Native American connections going back way before Buffalo Bill. There's a long history there. And it's a complex history. It's a colonial history. It's not a simple history. 
But but I think those two books, for me at least, were, were, were doorways into this a, a, a story. So I'll mention one other thing briefly, which is Braveheart, when it came out in 1995, 25 years ago, wasn't necessarily good history, but it got people interested in history. And I would hope the same claim be made for, for Outlander, that whatever you think of Outlander as history, um, it's, it's got people interested in, 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 in Scotland's past, including a past that we, we, we can't always be proud of. And I think that's an important move. Now, I'd like to introduce our panel now, or get our panel to introduce themselves. And I'd like to begin really with a, 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 a distinguished, honoured guest and, and speaker, uh, Marcella Lebeau, who was instrumental in securing the return of the ghost stand shut 21 years ago. She's a Lakota elder and she, she, she has great wisdom and, and, and knowledge. So I thought, Marcella, if you could maybe begin by saying a few words about your a, a, a role and relationship to the Go Stand Shirt. Okay. Introduce yourself and tell a little bit about the Go Stand a little bit. Oh, this is Marcella Lapone, Eagle Butte. Uh, in 1995, uh, I went with Mario Gonzalez and his family to make the request for the return of the sacred ghost Dance church. We weren't successful at that time. So Ian Sinclair from the Isle of Lewis, he did a lot of uh, work for us over there in, in uh, letting the people know about the situation and requesting support and that happened. So in 1998, we went back again, and this time Mario couldn't go with us. So my son Richard and I went. And at the time, uh, my son Richard, he felt compelled to go. And as we searched our genealogy, we found that my family on their father's side was a descendant, although the, the records were very sketchy. So, Richard and I went in 1998, and after uh, hearing at the Buell building, and then later, five days later, at the city council, we were successful in, uh, they granted us the right to bring the ghost and shirt home. But it wasn't as if we could just pick it up and bring it home. I guess they had certain things that they had to do over there before they could release the ghost shirt. So we waited. And then later, um, Mark O'Neill and John Lynch and his wife and uh, Liz Cameron, they brought the ghost shirt over to us in Eagle Butte. But on the way, when they got to the St. Paul, Minneapolis airport, they weren't allow allowed to leave the airport with the ghost shirt because they discovered that it had an eagle feather on the ghost shirt. And fortunately, we had a friend from Woodstock, Georgia that was coming. And so he was able to pick up the ghost shirt for us and bring it on to Eagle Butte. And at Eagle Butte, at our community center, we had a, a program. And there were two, uh, two bagpipe players that uh, offered to come and be a part of our program. And so we had a little program there at the Cultural Center in Eagle Butte before we took the ghost shirt onto Wounded Knee where we had a, a service there and then onto the Heritage Center in Pierce, South Dakota where we had a contract to hold the ghost shirt for us until the time when we could bring it home to our own reservation. And I believe that time is, is coming soon. Thank you for that, Ms. Marcella. And it is a remarkable story. And as you, as you said there, this is, it's still ongoing and so far as the ghost stand shirt has still to come to the, the, its home within the, 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 the community. So that is a, a, a really strong story. And I know that we have uh, among our, other panel members, 
experts on the, 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 the background and, and history of the ghost dance. And I wonder if I could go now to James Fennell and Jim Fennell, and who, um, and maybe Jim, if you introduce yourself and, and, and take it from there. Well, hi, Mitako um, Yepe. Greetings to my relatives. I'm Beto Ashtelo. It's a very good day. Um, if I was to introduce myself in such August company, I would say Dakota Shaje Mitawaken Shokakan Sapa Gereshka Emachi Yepe. So I've been given a Dakota name that allows me to speak. And I would also say Ate Wayaki Ian Pushtata Okashpe. And then some more, which means my father comes from the place where the stone or rock stands upright, uh, uh, that you know, a standing rock. My washitu uh, shaje, James Fenlon, uh, is then how I'd introduce myself of Dakota, Lakota, Gaelic, Irish, Viking, Grenorsk, and uh, French descent. Uh, it's a very great uh, honor, and I give great thanks to the people that have organized this panel. Uh, and that made this invitation to me. Um, uh, so we thank you, Pidamaya. And then uh, it is the greatest honor uh, to hear from uh, and uh, to be able to even speak with um, Marcella Lebeau, uh, who is one of the really esteemed uh, knowledge keepers and elders and knowers uh, that uh, I, uh, Mary Louise Defender from Standing Rock calls my uh, sons, uh, her grandsons. And it's this making of relations that is so important, that is so central to this entire story. It is truly a great honor and will be the, for the story she just told. It's an incredible, an incredible story. We also recognize where we're speaking from. Uh, this is these land acknowledgements. So I say I live and work from the indigenous homelands of the Serrano Yuhaviatam. Uh, Tongva, Vanyume, and Chemaweve people, descendant of my Dakota, Medewakantawa, and Lakota ancestors from Standing Rock, and recognize my descendancy of Gaelic, Irish, Scandinavian, and French um, ancestry. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, sociology, uh, where we've also formed a center uh, for uh, the study of indigenous peoples, um, especially when it's a firsthand study. And uh, from that is the context from which I will be speaking today uh, later on. We always uh, would also say, um, uh, you know, mitako uh, you know, the, uh, we are all related. It's an honor to be here. Okay, that's excellent. Th thank you. Um, and, and as I say, as you say later, you'll be you'll be showing us some slides and 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 and, and talking a little bit directly about the the the, the ghost stand shot. Our next panel member, Justin Gage, has a, a published an, a, an important book on the ghost dance a, a movement. Because just to remember that the, the shot is an as a as an object and and a, and a truly important a sacred one, but that there's a there's a, a much larger story behind this and that's something that maybe gets gets lost but if I just ask Justin then to to introduce himself. Hi everybody thank you for having me. Um, I am speaking from Arkansas in the U.S. Um, I acknowledge that this is the traditional homeland of the Osage Nation, the, care the original caretakers of this land, the Ozarks, the Ozark Mountains, and the Ozark Plateau. Um, I am a visiting researcher at the University of Helsinki um, also a fellow for the Humana Project funded by the Kona Foundation. The reason I'm not in Helsinki right now is because of the pandemic. Um, so I've, I've, I've been working from, from the States uh, for several months in quarantine. Um, I'm glad to see you're all in, in good health. I, I have taught um, for years here at the University of Arkansas, which is in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I can see the campus uh, down the hill here. Um, I'm not teaching this this year. Um, my 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 new book, which just came out, does focus in part on the ghost dance. I study uh, Native American intertribal networks of com communication during the, the early reservation years. I study how uh, many Native Americans who were separated by consequences of colonialism, uh, living on reservations, divided 
um, we're able to keep in touch and maintain uh, networks um, despite the colonial control and confinement of reservations. They, they stayed in touch through letter writing, uh, intertribal visiting, and they built networks um, in the 1870s, 1880s, communication networks, and they spread ideas that were important to them, including things like the ghost dance. Okay, that's excellent. So I think Silka Stroh is here, though I, I don't see her on my, my screen at the moment, but I think she's joined us as our a fourth panel member. Can, can Silka hear me? Yes, I can. Um... Hello everyone, uh, thanks for me too for the invitation to join. Uh, I'm calling in from Germany. I am based at the University of Münster, also in Germany, and I teach Scottish literature both in English and Gaelic and postcolonial studies and I was invited along to see a little bit about the Gaelic side of things. Okay that's terrific and I suppose we should, we, we, the Gaelic side of things w will come up because in some of the interviews that we, 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 we conducted before this event our recurrent themes seem to be the comparisons that people make or want to make between Highland culture, Gaelic culture, and Native American culture, which is obviously a very slippery and complicated topic, but it came up in different, different contexts, so it's something that we can touch on. I'm actually glad that Justin mentioned the technology and, and, the, and the pandemic, because the pandemic is a bad, is a terrible thing. It's a tragic thing that's affected us all, but I think it's forced a lot of us online to use the technology and engage with the technology in a way that means that an event like this might not have been possible pre-pandemic. So maybe after this pandemic is over, there will be more opportunities. I've spoken to Jim about this already, more opportunities to engage without, without having to, to, to travel. We can travel in time a, a, through, through, through Zoom. So I wonder if the, 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 the next thing to do is to look at some of the material that we have um, in terms of interviews. And my suggestion now would be to think about, because Buffalo Bill's visit to Glasgow was a spectacular event in, in, in so many ways. There, are, there is an amazing archive of images, but, but still lots of material to be found but it's part of Glasgow's folklore. And that's how it's more likely to be understood than through proper histories with the kind of detail that, 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 that Tom Cunningham has, has managed to reach into or Sam Madra and, and, and her excellent work. So there's a, a lot of it is kind of folk memory and folk a, a culture. So maybe it would be worth thinking about, one of the people that we spoke to was Nori Wilson. And Nori Wilson is, an excellent a, a archivist. He runs the Lost Glasgow site. So I'm sure a lot of people that are on looking at this event just now know that know about Nori's work. And Nori recently on Lost Glasgow posted some uh, new images of Buffalo Bill's um, visit to, 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 to Glasgow. There were two separate visits a decade apart. So if, if, if I don't know if Lisa's got that, clip lined up, but we might just look at what, what um, Nori has to say um, now. Certainly by the 1890s, Glasgow audiences would have seen silent westerns. Uh, they'd have read pulp, cowboy fiction, uh, not just in cheap, cheap books, but also in the newspapers. Uh, much of it admittedly written by East Coast Americans who had never seen the Wild West. Much of it was complete fiction, complete bunkum, basically sort of pantomime cowboys and Indians. And you, uh, so when the real thing turns up in town, you're, you're going to want to go and see it, particularly when it's Buffalo Bill. I mean, a name that was already globally famous. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Scotland, Glasgow to a certain extent, had also sort of forerun that because if you go down to Sucky Hall Street where the, the ABC is today, originally when that was Hengler Circus, they put on Wild West shows as well. It's that strange thing, the, the amount of Glaswegians that will tell you that their, their grandfather or grandmother 
met Geronimo or Sitting Bull, when of course Geronimo and Sitting Bull were nowhere near Glasgow. But it's as those stories get handed down. And of course there were you know, great North American names, great Sioux names, you know, Kicking Bear, Iron Horse and all the rest of it. And slowly over the years, you know, yeah, Kicking Bear becomes Sitting Bull and Iron Horse becomes Geronimo because Glasgow, to, th think, to a certain extent, wanted to think that they'd met those characters. They wanted to actually think that they'd met with history. Okay, so that was, that was Nori Wilson. And I think Nori, he, he, working with Lost Glasgow and, 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 and trying to dig out some of these lost images, really touches on something, which is, I was actually reminded of that line of Yeats, we have fed the heart on fantasy, too long a sacrifice makes a stone of the heart. And in Glasgow, there's always been a great romantic, a, a, you know, a, 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 there's a great deal of myth-making and a great deal of, of folklore and imagining, some of it extremely in, 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 inventive. Uh, 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 Glasgow novel, Scottish novel, just won the Booker Prize, so there's an enormous imagination, but that's not always accompanied by historical inquiry or, 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 or rigour or, or even knowledge, because one of the things that, that Tom Cunningham said in, 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 in his interview, we'll, we'll see something from him shortly, was at one point he said, you know, the west of Scotland is one of the spiritual homes of, of, of the Wild West. And that's interesting when you think of emigration and all kinds of other interactions, but it's also interesting in terms, I would say, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a certain kind of romantic imagination or, 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 or wish, wishfulness, really, of, of escapism, if you like. And, and when Buffalo Bill wrote to the Daily Record after his second stint in, in Scotland, when he did a week in Glasgow that was sold out, he had the biggest audience outside of Chicago in Glasgow, and, and he, he wrote a letter of thanks he, he, because of that, the, the size of that, that and, the, and, and the, the, the enthusiasm of that Glasgow audience. But I think that's part of that, that, that fantasy, really, that, that wish, wishful thinking and that desire and need for escape. And Nori was also there talking about the invention of the Wild, the wild West. Now, I wonder if, if this is the moment to... Um, well, unless, do any of the panel have a response or have something to say at, at, at the moment? If not, I might go on then and, and, and maybe we should have a clip from, from Tom Cunningham. And, and I'll just say again that Tom Cunningham um, actually stu studied law at, at the University of Glasgow and then th through, through a particular set of circumstances became interested in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, which... Um, uh, a, a little bit, maybe around the same time, a little bit earlier than, than Sam Madra, um, but interested in it and, and started digging into it. And this is the, the, the book that I would highly uh, recommend because it's so rich in information. And I know that Tom at the moment is in the process of excavating or, or digging out the, so that he can have all the names of the Lakota who were in a, a Glasgow for, for, for certainly for that, for that first visit, maybe for both visits. So I don't know if you have that clip lined up, Lisa. Right, the, the massacre of Wounded Knee, of course, was uh, a, a humanitarian tragedy. It was, it was a dreadful affair. You know, a lot of people lost their lives, a lot of men, women and children. Um, were, 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 were gunned down when there was absolutely no military necessity for doing so. But it was transformed into a sort of very bad taste entertainment sensation of the age because uh, there were various spin-off uh, entertainments perpetrated not just by Buffalo Bill but by other companies, touring companies as well, in which there were grossly inaccurate de depictions of the ghost dance. Um, anything at, at all, like the Omaha dance or the Buffalo dance were, were, were passed off as the ghost dance, when in fact the ghost dance itself was join hands and dance 
in a shuffling circle until you dance yourself dizzy and start hallucinating. So I think one of the aspects of the, the, the Buffalo Bills Wild West show, because there were so many different elements to it uh, uh, and so many different uh, uh, aspects to it, it, was, it included some very early re reenactments. I mean, I, I don't know enough about the history of the 19th century, but it seems to me that Buffalo Bill was pioneering and not, not just partly inventing the Wild West, but actually restaging aspects of recent Western history, obviously putting a particular spin on them and, and then again roping in uh, his, his performer captors to be part of that, that story, that, that image, that invention of the, 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 the West. Tom uses the word uh, uh, spin there. So I think there's definitely a, 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 and that's partly the myth, I think, that's been, that's been inherited. I wonder if this is a moment now to invite a uh, James Fennell and Jim to maybe give us a little bit of detail uh, from his perspective. He's, I know that you have some slides, um, Jim, that you wanted to, 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 to show us. I don't know if you can um, activate them from, by sharing the screen um, from your side. Okay, uh, we will try and do that. I have two screens here, so um, let me see if I get this uh, correctly here. And then if we move this to slideshow. Um, and then I think I just discovered that you can switch screens. Where is that display settings? Uh, and you can swap presenter view. So you should have a slide in front of you now. Uh, my presentation here is pulled from a lot of other work that I've done. I'm speaking primarily as a scholar, but also a person that had given presentations up in uh, North Dakota when I was uh, working both on Standing Rock and with other people. And the idea was that we have to land both uh, the ghost dance and the things that um, uh, happened there in a time and place that respects Lakota and Dakota uh, cultures and histories, as well as um, looks at what uh, the so-called dominant society uh, was up to. So if you look at this screen here, uh, basically, um, we're say, we say that these things have to be taken into context. And that is, as was so wonderfully said, the frontier is constructed in the Western mind, including by a lot of scholars. Uh, and that's also the construction of the Wild West, which comes from the, the concept of wilderness, which was not true anywhere on Turtle Island. So in looking at that history and tradition, uh, I can only speak to this very briefly uh, in the, the presence of people that have so much more knowledge of me, but um, you know, we would briefly bring up uh, the Iwanyawa Chipi, the Sundance as a great and beautiful ceremony that relates to the environment, the people um, uh, in a very, very peaceful and constructive way where one can get visions, uh, where uh, one can uh, perform healing ceremonies. In other words, it's the opposite of the way that it was being presented by the dominant society which had uh, basically uh, begin to typify uh, native peoples that fought back, that resisted, that defended their homelands as hostiles. And I see we have people here that have written books on this. Um, and the key element here is the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. There'd been two years of warfare. Uh, the Lakota had won uh, almost all of those battles with an exception or two. And therefore the United States was forced to make this treaty, which uh, uh, gave, uh, didn't give, you know, it allowed in a minimized way, um, at least half of South Dakota to be a permanent reservation. And then importantly, they fought for this. Uh, it took all the Black Hills as a sacred lands which you had to ask permission to enter. And then it took all this other area in Montana and Wyoming, parts of North Dakota, and called it unceded land, which meant it was not ceded to the government. It was still under the purview of Lakota and Dakota, and also Cheyenne, Arapaho, 
and, and uh, Crow people. Uh, and it was on this land that the Little Bighorn was fought, which became so central to all of it, 1876, was actually on treaty land. And it was thought of as the Indian War. So it was the United States and its militaries that was breaking the treaty. Um, they were defeated so terribly, and I love how um, Mrs. LeBeau uh, presented that. So hopefully she'll share uh, something with us on that again. That's, that's the way the old ones always talk about that. Um, that uh, the uh, Sitting Bull in Gaul, especially Gaul is one of the great leaders that fought there, went up to Canada. The very famous uh, Crazy Horse fights an insurgency for a while, but finally comes on in, does not surrender. Some people have that wrong. And um, uh, the United States debriefed what had happened there. It was such a terrible loss for them. Uh, my father used to say they taught it at uh, um, uh, at uh, the uh, the army institutes of academies for years, you know, as to how they lost there. They found out about this grand Sundance that Sitting Bull and other people had called to have ceremonies to make the strong hearts, and so then they passed through legislation the Indian Offenses Act in 1883. The very first thing, the greatest offense against the United States of America, literally in English, is called the Sundance. Uh, then you go through these years of the Allotment Act, uh, 1887, they're taking more land, they create fake treaties, 1888, bring the leaders in, they all turn them down, they say, no, you have to respect us. 1889, they create the two states, North and South Dakota. They're breaking all the conditions, the people are starving, uh, people are attacking Lakota and Dakota people all over the place, uh, uh, and it becomes a very tough time that this revitalization, this quasi-Christian movement comes in, especially in 1889, but also in 1890, called the Ghost Dance, and it would be Wanahiwachipi, which is, really means it's a way to contact the ancestors, the spirits, and see everything that would be good in the life. And so you might draw a little bit from the Sundance, but it's completely new and different set of ceremonies, but one that makes sense to the people. The United States hated that so much that they sent in the militaries. Importantly, uh, the um, uh, and it's from this icons of the frontier rise, uh, the, the United States um, president ordered the arrest of Sitting Bull and the transfer to the military department. Of course, he was killed. Uh, some Indian police were involved in that. That's one of the stories I lecture on separately. Um, and other people, and those people left and went down the Cheyenne River and connected with uh, the people that you know as Bigfoot's people and so on. And there, another set of army units refused to accept, you know, that they had called on the rights of relatives. Uh, and therefore, they had to leave in the, uh, in the wintertime and travel for the protection of their people. And of course, they're killed uh, at Wounded Knee. So therefore, this battle that seems to trigger so much of it, this is a Buffalo Hyde uh, painting of the repulse at Medicine Tail Coulee, is viewed as a defense of the people, uh, which would be the right of the Akichita and the other warrior societies not to attack. It's not Custer's last stand. It is a defense of the people. Um, and it is connected with the ancient traditions. So when we gave those lectures, we found these pictures, uh, even the great Peabody Museum at Harvard that had ghost dance shirts, which they, I believe, returned or should have uh, because we found them there. We found these pictures and it had to bring down part of the exhibit at their museum. Uh, we gave some talks there because they were supposed to be impossible. In other words, Dakota and Lakota people kept the Sundance alive, but secret from the dominant society. Um, and, and so that's important to remember. Uh, so another way of looking at the ghost dance is when it comes in, the people are asking to return to this beautiful way of life that might include their ceremonies. It might include the respect of their relatives. Uh, uh, what a, it, it, the buffalo and all this. It wasn't to attack the white man, the Washichu. The Washichu were not in the visions that they got because it was a vision from the ancestors of the past. And it was also a calling upon pity uh, uh, in, a, in a Christian way. Um, and, and that's so important to remember too. Particular to the ghost dance shirts is that they did have, they were the only used among the Lakota. Nobody else used those. And so that's why the military never, they're using that and they're calling it bulletproof. They're gonna use that to attack us, which was you know, a terrible thing that they said. Uh, but it probably was connected with the idea of the shirt wearers in traditional society, which gave you some authority to 
um, uh, both do civil law and perhaps uh, to uh, structure um, what the people were doing. Um, and, and so that was also misunderstood. So when these are used as excuses for uh, the killings at Wounded Knee, um, we instead look at that as a genocidal event, totally unnecessary as your, uh, as your speaker wrote, uh, spoke of here, um, in the sense of the military was looking to wipe out the idea that these people had a deep spirituality and had defeated them in open field battle um, and had met this treaty and had lived, even though some of them had not agreed to it, had lived in a respectful way. Um, and that's what gives it its particular powerful form. Um, and so I've been told when I speak of these things, I always have to remember to honor and recognize uh, uh, the people that fought and have survived. Um, and, and so this is what is so wonderful about having Marcelo Lebeau and other people speak this way. The first time I did this, I did it with Mary Louise Defender and she, uh, she structured it in a certain way. So we can look at what was happening. This is what makes those ghost dance shirts sacred, right? They represent all of this as well as what the dominant society did. And so to return them, to treat them in a respectful way, along with all these treaty relations, would be a way to honor the earth and the people who live on Turtle Island. And that is my presentation. Itakoyasu. I was muted. I'd muted myself, which I do quite often. So I wonder if this is a good opportunity to bring Justin in, because Justin has worked on the wider implications of the of the ghost dance movement, and obviously that's we, we're looking specifically at the ghost dance shirt Lakota, um, and 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 its sacred nature. But maybe Justin would would say a word about the broader context of the ghost dance movement. Yeah, sure. So. I don't want to repeat much of what James said. Of course, what he said is, is true. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak generally about the movement. Um, for those who don't know, the ghost dance movement that we, we, we call the ghost dance movement, it, it began largely in, in early 1889, uh, perhaps late 1888 in Western Nevada um, on or near the Walker River Reservation. And the intellectual originator of this, of this this what becomes a continental religious movement. Um, the guy's name was uh, Wovoka, or also known as Jack Wilson. He was a, a Paiute. Um, he believed that that God had instructed him to, during a vision, God, God had instructed, instructed him to um, relay a message to, to all indigenous people uh, in, in North America. The idea that if you, if you uh, perform a certain dance, if you do it with devotion um, and you, you live a life of certain ethics that he, that he taught, that your world would change in a revolutionary way. Uh, your world would change um, largely in, in a way that would eliminate uh, the colonizers from your life, white people. Most, most folks who, who believed in the ghost dance uh, movement, they believed that the world would, would become better that would become better because white people would disappear and, and former ways of life would return without white involvement. Now, um, it's important to understand, and a lot of people don't understand this about the ghost dance, is that it wasn't a, a, it wasn't a single ghost dance doctrine. It was a non-doctrinal uh, religion. Um, Native indigenous religion, uh, at least in North America, um, is not like Western traditions where, where it's dogmatic. Um, the ghost dance was received um, differently by different people, many different ways. It was received not only uh, as a member of a certain tribal culture, and of course, it's important to know there are dozens and dozens of, of different nation, tribal nations who, who heard about this, this ghost dance. Um, not only did they receive it uh, Within their own traditions and customs, they also received it individually. What they, what they, how they understood it individually, and so um, even though there was a, a a specific general message that 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 Wovoka taught, especially a, that, that you should do a certain dance, the dance evolves 
the dance changes, the ideas surrounding that dance are different um, from tribe to tribe, even from individual to individual. So Kiowas, um, Paiutes, Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Lakotas, they, they understood the dance differently, even though they were sharing ideas about the dance amongst themselves across, across reservation boundaries. Um, Lakotas, uh, for instance, you know, they, they believe that, they, that if you wore a sacred shirt, that, that you'd be protected. Um, other tribes um, did not have these, these ghost shirts. It was exclusive to Lakotas. Um, so this was a massive movement and it spread rapidly through, through networks of communication. And this, the ideas that were being spread here, uh, these religious ideas and anti-colonial ideas were ideas that, that made the US government nervous. It, the, the, the government, US officials, policymakers, white settlers, um, they did not like any intertribal interaction. Um, they knew the power of intertribal uh, interaction. It, uh, there's power in numbers um, and they wanted these notions to stop. Now, the purpose of the reservation system, um, not only of course, was it to, to the purpose was to, to rob Native Americans of their, of their lands, but reservations were, were places where natives could be kept, kept confined, um, kept under the control of, of, of the US government. Um, and so on these reservations, the people living on them would be changed. They would be changed into um, so-called civilized people, white, more like white Americans, Americans, white Americans who, who, who taught, who spoke English, who believed uh, in Christianity, who would someday, uh, according to these Policymaker, racist policymakers who are making these theories, they would become, they would become American citizens without any any tribal um, identity. That was the goal of these. Of course, it's a ridiculous goal. It didn't work. Um, um, so, on reservations, Native Americans were being told not to do things like like believe in an indigenous ideas, not just religious ideas, but but all all matters of the culture, the way they the way. They organize their lives, the way they organize their society. And so the ghost sense was one of many things that the government tried to prevent from spreading. Um, and unfortunately, uh, some folks were very threatened by the ghost, especially when, when Native Americans would, would simply ignore the instructions of their, their Indian agents. And so, of course, it leads to the tragedy. Now, we all hopefully know about the, the massacre, the murder at Wounded Knee. It's also important to know that the ghost dance persists years after uh, Wounded Knee. Wounded Knee was not the end of the ghost dance at all. It, it, the ideas surrounding the ghost dance, especially the idea that, that um, God or a great spirit um, um, is, is, um, will make your life better. The idea that, that, that if, you, if, you, if you follow certain ethics that that your life can change in revolutionary ways. These these ideas don't don't leave, uh, even after the ceremonial ghost dance itself um, lost some ground. Um, so that's that's why I want to leave you with is that the the idea that we need ended the ghost dance that is of course incorrect. Okay, well that's really interesting because what you've said connects with a well I, I think of 17th century radical religious a, a, a ideas that, that went over to to to, to the United States, but. Marcella talked about the sacred nature of the ghost dance shirt. Jim spoke of quasi-Christian kind of connotations. And you talk about the religion. This might be a moment to um, look at what a, a Mungo Campbell of the Hunterian has had to say about the repatriation of the ghost dance shirt, because something that interests me is, is the ghost dance shirt an exception because of its exceptional status or did Glasgow museums and this pioneering, you know, really absolutely progressive leading move, decolonizing the museum, returning this, this shirt, did they open a door to, to a whole different way of thinking about museums or is the ghost stand shirt something special and something sacred and therefore not like other relics, other objects, other a, 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 Exhibit. So maybe just looking at what you know, Mungo Campbell has to say about that, the status of these objects and the, 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 the ethics, if you like, of return.
So the recognition that an object or a group of objects um, has become known to a community but is in a sense in the wrong place at the wrong time for the wrong reasons is a major driver to how we approach the business of restitution, the repatriation of objects. And when one understands that in a city like Glasgow, the story of Buffalo Bill and his presence here in Glasgow is still something which is understood and is known, and the objects and stories associated with his presence in Glasgow have become part of the city fabric. And yet, an object like the ghost shirt shouldn't have come to Scotland. You find yourself in a situation where there is a real opportunity, very publicly, to say the world has moved on. The stories about that object won't go away, but the nature of the story that brought the object to Glasgow won't go away either. That's a very important statement for a municipality to send out. It's a very important statement for any institution to set out. So I think that that idea, I mean, apparently one of the stories around the, 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 um, the ghost stand shirt is that it was one of a number of artifacts that George Crager, the, the Lakota interpreter, had in his possession and had brought with him to, 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 to Glasgow. Another issue that arises is, you know, one, one curator apparently at the time, 19, in the 1990s, worried that this would open the floodgates to repatriation. And I think we're much more in a moment of decolonizing museums now than we were in 1999. I think Glasgow was really quite pioneering, both the city council and the university. And one of the, the people in the university that was very uh, uh, heavily involved in that process of returning the ghost and shut was Sam Madra. Um, I know I know we have a, we have Pat Pat Allen with us. Uh, uh, I've been chatting back and forth with her in the, in the, the chat, and hopefully she'll have a, a something to say too. But we did speak to Sam Madra, who um, was, was was doing a PhD thesis and in, in, in at the time, and was one of those in the university familiar with and, and knowledgeable about the ghost stand shut. So we spoke to Sam about the, the, the process yeah. there. And this is what she had to say. Well, one thing I think is really important um, and I think Glasgow Museums has to be commended for doing, is that they presently have on display the replica ghost tent shirt that was presented um, by Marcella Lebeau, who was a representative of the Wounded Knee Survivors Association. She crafted it herself and she presented it to, to the Glasgow City Council when she came for the, the public hearing. Glasgow Museums have that shirt on display, not as... Um, a facsimile of the original shirt, but one that now tells very much of the contemporary story of the return. And I think it's it's really important that um, this is there because it gives the contemporary um, Lakota people a voice and it tells their story as much as the sort of romanticized fantasy of the 19th century Lakota that Buffalo Bill was, was telling us about. Um, it gives a very contemporary story. So that that was Sam, who, as I say, was was very much involved in the, that that process of, of of return. But as as has been made clear, and this is part, I think, of a of a debate, and 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 maybe a Marcella would want to come in at this point because that idea of the ghost stands shut as being the exceptional. You know, and I'm also interested in the idea of something that is taken 
becomes a museum exhibit. And in a way, it never really shakes off that status, which was not its original a, 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 a purpose or, or, or meaning, if you like. So maybe since Marcella, you were talking about the, the ghost and shirt having this new home, which is in the process of being set up. But I wondered if there were, there were any other items or, or relics or artifacts that you felt should still be part of a, of, of a conversation, of a negotiation, of a discussion. Oh, raincoats, love, rain in the face, beautifulness. He's asking, he's asking you if there are other items that you think should be returned. Oh, this is Marcella. Um, there are other items in the museum in Vasco, Scotland that should be returned to the Native American people. They were taken apparently at Wounded Knee by uh, George Krager and were left there, were left there at the museum. And uh, we, we looked at them when we were there at the museum. And I, I, I believe that they belong to the Native American people and they should be returned. They were taken at Wounded Knee as we were told. And so, yes, there are artifacts there that need to be returned to the Lakota people. Okay, one of the things that I think is interesting, especially listening to you, Marcella, because I, I, be, I believe you're what, 101 years old, is that right? One that you're, I, I'm not sure if I have your age correct, but I think one of the things in, in listening to you and, and learning from you is that we think of 1891, 1890, 1991, 92 as history and, and quite removed. But my, my own grandfather was born in 1871 and Tom Bryan, who, who was one of the people we spoke to for, for this event. Tom Bryan, and who we'll hear from, um, wrote a poem about his memories of his grandmother. And his grandmother was four months old at the time of the Wounded Knee Massacre. So I think that sense of, of, of memory and of touching the coattails of history or, 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 or the, 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 the garment of, of, of history is really important that, and I think the more time goes by, the less distant, and maybe this is another consequence of, of time or of getting older of or of technology or being reminded of things, is that we realize that this was not the distant past and this is still part of, a, of an ongoing present. So may, maybe we could hear um, Tom Bryan's poem about his, his, his grandmother and, and his, his memories there. I uh, wrote a poem called Calgary Kitchen, 1955. Gutting yellow perch at the sink, her smile came from another age. She had enough soul, me, for fish, for a lineage of creatures back to bison times. For men who once came to her homestead door asking, where have the woolly creatures gone? When will they come back? What have you whites done to them? Now we must wear the ghost shirt to force the return. Her skin and eyes as dark as theirs, like them of greed, drought, or lightning fire. She gave me the perch heads and tails for my prairie skeleton museum smiling as I buried them for later scientific study, still smiling, who had seen it all, had seen enough. That's Calgary Kitchen, 1955. So that was Tom talking about the memories of the, of the 1890s from, 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 the 19, from the perspective of a, a, the 1950s. And I think that sense of family and, and memory and, and, and is, is really important and maybe has to be put alongside notions of history and, and, and fact and so on. And my, my own view is that 
the rate of return of on, and repatriation of objects should really be about the, the the doing the right thing by by the communities concerned rather than by 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 institutions but that's my my view i wonder if since we have we have we're, we're, we're making good time we want to bring in questions but i'm aware of the fact that we have one short interview that we haven't shown yet and that's with because we did say that our starting point for 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 for, for the, the the event was outlander now outlander um as i say is is, is no more historical strictly speaking than, than than braveheart or or than buffalo bill's wild west show but one of the things outlander I think has probably tries to do in ways that that that, that Buffalo Bill didn't certainly didn't and most of the Hollywood westerns haven't is to have some kind of ethical engagement with material culture and and we spoke to a uh, Sally Tucker who's at the University of Glasgow who's who's who knows a bit about the the kind of if you like the craft and and, and culture and this is something that Marcella could speak could to speak. as well. Yeah. well but Sally, so Sally Tuckett has something to say about this, about the, the, the material culture around Outlander. Well, it's, it's not necessarily a role of a period drama to educate the viewer in terms of the trade and the behind the scene processes of how these garments are made and exchanged. I think what Outlander does also introduce is this idea that um, the colonial relationship was a very complex one and that is evident in the clothing and you start off with the series when they're based in Scotland and you've got the the differences between the Highlanders and the supposedly more civilized and educated English with um, or even the French courts with their tailored clothing, their fancy silks compared with the Highland dress, which is um, has a much more rustic aesthetic in Outlander. And that's very much playing up on stereotypes of 18th century society. And then when you get into the North American colonial context, you're obviously dealing with um, a society who is very much beholden to Britain as the motherland, um, for want of a better word. And all of the goods that they had, all the clothing and cloth and fabric, pretty much had to come from either Britain or imported on British ships. So they couldn't make their own clothes. Um, and when it comes to enslaved societies, a lot of the fabrics would have actually been made in Britain and specifically Scotland. So the linen in particular that you see the enslaved workers and enslaved people wearing in Outlander, in reality, in historical reality, much of that could have been made in Scotland itself. So I'm fascinated by this idea of, of, of clothing and garments. And I know that one of the stories about Buffalo Bill's visit is that something that the Native Americans or the entourage of, of Buffalo Bill took back with them to the States where, where was kilts. They took, they took kilts back with them. And whether or not that's the, the, the case or and what significance we can attach to, to that, maybe this is a moment to bring in Silke to, to say something about the, the, the viability or feasibility, because it came up in several of the interviews, this Highlander Native American connection. And I know there's a bit of, of, of work that's been done on this and, and people won't want to make a connection because they want to take the romantic Highlander and put them alongside the, the, the a romanticized image of the, the Native American. But maybe I wonder if you just wanted to say a word about how much water you think that, that holds or, or why it took took hold in the imagination. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you. Um, you already said that part of the temptation is probably, um, well, there's a certain romantic image of Native Americans. And um, I think, for example, Scottish people who, or other white people, white Europeans who, who subscribe to that romantic image, I think finding a European culture like the Highland culture that is supposedly closer to Native American culture is a bridge almost between them um, say modern Scots today who might not be Gaelic speaking either uh, and but they feel yeah our ancestors were Gaelic speaking or there's still people in my country are Gaelic speaking they're kind of a pre-capitalist society there's a certain link um, then that also brings us to the romanticized Native Americans and I think that's maybe part of this uh, reason 
um, why people subscribe to these ideas. Um, but of course, it is highly problematic. And actually, um, I think the earliest um, alignments that I've seen along those lines are from the 18th century, and they come from Anglo Scots and English people who, of course, describe um, both Native Americans and Highlanders as um, barbarians and savages. And of course, for them, all barbarians were the same. And I think that's where the equation comes from, but it's very really much a colonial viewpoint. Um, and I think it's, it's only later, I think that also, you know, that starts to take hold amongst the Gales themselves, but it's also true that, for example, in the 18th century and also partly in the 19th, lots of Gales were quite keen to distance themselves from Native Americans, despite personal encounters and friendships and amity that might have taken place. Um, but I suspect it probably wasn't more common amongst them and the Native Americans and amongst other Scots or Brits and the Native Americans if life conditions turned out a certain way. Um, but definitely in the literature that they left behind, the Gales in the 18th century, 19th century often said, no, we are civilized as well and we want to have this, this distance is only a few exceptions. So it's fascinating you do mention exceptions because season four of Outlander does try to make these connections and show that there were some underlying affinities. I mean, young Ian, a, a Jamie's nephew, goes off to and, and, and stays with the Mohawk and so on. So there is a sense of of, of kind of, as it were, going native, as yes. they would say, but definitely a sense in which they have shared Maybe it's to do with the land or being put off your land. Maybe it's to do with what you wear. Maybe it's to do with differences in your language. But these are these are what people reach for when they're talking about it. Even even people talking about Buffalo Bill coming to Glasgow talk about the Highlanders who would be cattle drovers, who would be used to living with animals, who would be from similar landscapes to the 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 the, the Lakota. If that's that's the, the the impression that people might have. Well, I think we've exhausted our our, our clips, and so we haven't exhausted all of our. A, a images, but rather than, than, than show the, them just now, I wonder if the right thing to do, and Cassie can put me right, is to, is to have a look at or, or, and, and, and see if we can find some answers to the questions that people have been posing. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. Though, um, please do keep them coming. Um, we have one question from um, Patricia Allen, and I wonder actually, um, Patricia, would you, would you like to ask this question directly? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, don't feel that you have to at all, but um, if, if... Ask it, what, what is it? <laughs> uh, um, are there similarities? I've got a lot of questions about different things. So. Um, are there similarities, you asked, between Wovoka prophecies and the influence of, and you're going to have to um, forgive my pronunciation. Of course, the leader is, of course, a prophet in... I, no, it was a question I asked, so I don't, I don't know the answer. <laughs> no, absolutely. So I was just wondering if you'd like to ask it to the panel. Oh, ask it. Okay, well, let me find it again so I can try and get the name. So that would be uh, to anyone who it's uh, relating to the actual ghost dance. And I wondered if they could see similarities. Actually, I guess I can uh, between the Wobokar's prophecies and those of actually, I can't do the clicks. If, there's any, if there are any South Africans or Southern Africans here, they could help me out with the pronunciation. So it would be non use and the cost of cattle killing of the 1850s, because it was, you know, they, he also prophesied, you know, the returning of, you know, the ancestors who would drive out the colonizers. And, but the people, instead of it had, so the cost of men had to kill their cattle and it created, it caused an enormous famine. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, there are similar, there seem to be similarities, but does anyone else want to talk about this? Maybe Jim or, or Justin. Jim? I could make a quick response and we'll hear from Justin. And that is, uh, I, I used uh, in my first book, uh, there's an anthropologist, uh, I think his name was Anthony Wallace. Um, and he wrote about revitalization movements. Um, and that would apply there in a complicated way. But a better place to look is in lots, even on North America. So uh, there was a revitalization movement with visions, a sense of coming back of the old ways. Handsome Lake is very famous. But the, probably the best place to look is at Tecumseh's brother. His name was Tenskwatawa. And he actually got visions and they had to throw away everything Christian, all alcohol, and try and embrace the old ways. So there's, there's lots of similarities there. Okay, thank you. Justin, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I... I don't know anything at all about this, this the South African um, movement. It sounds really interesting. But I, you know, 
it's it's difficult to to try to theorize you know what what you what you end up doing is theorizing basically with the purpose of religion you know what 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 religion means to people um you know most it, it's way too complicated to answer now but but you know any religious movement in a sense um there are hopes and there are expectations um people who have these beliefs find, find themselves in different in different circumstances i, I think you know it, it's also dangerous to see the ghost dance as as a movement that is simply looking for a return to you know traditional life uh, the ghost dance itself was very innovative it 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 it, it wasn't simply um just a movement um you know returning to the old-fashioned ways <sighs> um the uh the band frightened rabbit my, my glasgow friends might know frightened rabbit the band i can't believe i have a chance to, to quote this band <laughs> Uh, during a during a a Zoom meeting with Glas Gla Glasgow folks, but but you know their song "Old Fashioned," right? Old old fashioned, going back to the way things used to be, right? Um, we 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 shouldn't see you know all these religious um, movements as simply um, trying to go back to being old fashioned. Um, um, of course, the ghost dance was trying to change, was it was a was a means to make your life better. Um, but, they, but, but it was also an innovative uh, religious movement as well. Okay, that's excellent and, 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 and a, a fascinating. I wonder if we want to move on to a different question. One, one of the things that we, ha we haven't dwelt on maybe is this, this fact of a, a photographic record, which is obviously incomplete because I know that some of our, our interviewees have looked at some photographs that have since disappeared and, and, and we know from correspondence that many more images were taken than, than we actually have. If I, maybe if I could share my screen for a moment, I could I could bring up those just a couple of those Im images to look at. I don't know if you if, if this if my screen is visible at the moment. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just show a couple of those. Is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just show those. So th these are these are there was three kinds of photography as far, far as I can make out. There was studio photography. And, and there are some remarkable images. This is, is 40 Bell Grove Street, the, the, the um, Denison studio. And, and there, are, there are, so there's studio photographs, there's action shots of the, of the Wild West show itself with, with, with rifles shooting and, and horse riding and so on. And then there's street photography and some of the street photography is interesting because that's where you see the Native American actors walking down Dixon Avenue or walking around Duke Street in, in, in the East End and, be, and being gawked at. I've not, I've not got any of those here, but those are the kind of iconic ones. And, and my first image, this is an image of the, the Glasgow tenements in the background and, 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 and what looks like a very f f familiar figure to us. And again, this is in the, the Deniston uh, photo company, 40 Bell Grove Street. But, but to put out an appeal, because I know we have quite, quite a group of people um, in, 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 on, online at the moment, and to repeat something that Nori Wilson said, which is, and Tom Cunningham, we, we know there are many more images out there. So if there's anybody who has a cache of photographs that haven't really been gone through from that, that period, then, then, then please uh, uh, come forward, because there are, clearly we've only got the tip of an iceberg of an archive of, 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 of images. And, and we know that there are many more remarkable examples. Is there another question, Cassie, that we can? There is, and I suppose it draws again on this, um, I suppose, juxtapositioning um, of, of culture. So um, Daniel um, Peterson asks, um, particularly to the Lakota panelists, but it could, we could open it up to, to everyone. What, what is their opinion on the affinities between Highlanders and uh, a Native American culture? Um, I wonder, would, if anyone would like to take that one first and be building on what Silke was saying. Maybe Marcella would say something here because Marcella, I know, like Jim, has got Irish and, and, and I know that, I believe Jim also is Scot Scottish, I might be wrong about that, but maybe Marcella would want to say something about what she thinks of the, the, the idea that there's some kind of special connection between a, a Scotland and Native American peoples beyond the great gesture of returning the ghost stand shut and the possible promise of doing more. 
So I wonder what Marcella thinks. Is she here now? Or? I don't see her just now. Let's have Maybe Jim wants to uh, try and answer that then. Jim, what's your view of, oh. of, of this comparison? Does it stand up? There's probably some connections there. If Marcella gets back on, she is the one definitely that we would turn to and respect. And it kind of, it's a little bit um, responsive to the other question too. So uh, the, the way I resolve the problem of, um, or the huge benefit or privilege of talking about Lakota spirituality, which is often sacred, and you have to earn the right to speak of certain things, and certain things are not said in certain contexts or other ways or depending upon groups. And it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite clear what that would be, is that we talk about things that look like, because many Lakota people would say that the way of life of being a Lakota, which would include the Sundance and Hambleacha and uh, so many of these other things, INIP and so on, um, is a way of life. But we can look upon it as how it compares to a religion in, um, the, yeah, in other contexts. And when we do that, um, I think there is a similarity besides the warrior concept, which would be a kichita, there might be some connection there. Uh, but in the decolonizing context, we could think, and I don't know this history, you know, maybe I've watched a couple of shows and I have my own stereotypes, uh, is um, the sense that there's an incoming or dominant society, uh, English, uh, England, the United States, America, and it wants its version, its religion, its idea of either Christianity, or whatever, to be dominant. So it just kind of wipes out everything it sees uh, among this people, which looks, which is a different worldview. It's a different worldview. And I think that might be a place to look and explore. That's fascinating. So I, th I think that Marcella might have joined us a a now, but it's, that's so interesting what you said, Jim, because I remember a conversation with a, with a Native American student in, in Dartmouth, New Hampshire in 1997, where she had an interest in Braveheart and wanted it to be more historical than I could make her think it was, even though I'd, <laughs> having started by demythologizing it, I realized that for her, it was a point of contact along exactly the lines you're suggesting, which was resistance to this colonial power or centralizing power. And, and, and for the same reasons, it was popular in, in, in other problematic contexts to do with anti-federalism and anti-centrism. Anti but maybe if Marcella has joined us, Marcella might say something if she can about whether, the, whether she has any, whether Scotland has any special place in her heart or whether the, 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 she thinks there is a, 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 a valid link between Irish and Scottish culture and Native American culture that might be different or distinct, say, from, from, from English relations. So he's asking you now yes. if there's a relation, you think there's a relationship between the Native American and the this Scottish Gaelic Gaelic. This is Marcella again. I just uh, was thinking of, about Ian Sinclair over in the Isle of Lewis. And as we became friends and g g had the chance to visit, uh, it came that uh, his people were treated somewhat like the Native Americans were treated. And our own uh, reservation here in South Dakota, we were, as children, we were sent to boarding schools where we weren't allowed to speak our own language or or uh, have anything the same as our own Lakota culture. And it was a devastating thing that happened to us because I know that when I went to the boarding school, we went to school half a day and we worked half a day. And the little children that came at age five and six, they never saw their people, their grandmothers, their mothers, their family all year. And when they came for them in the spring of the year, those little children wouldn't even go to their mothers and their grandmothers because that time span had done something to them emotionally. And those are the things that happened to us as Native Americans. And it was devastating what happened. And that, that carries on even to today when we didn't, we didn't teach our own children 
the Lakota language because of what happened to us. And we didn't want them abused and mistreated like our children were. So all of that has been, had an, a great impact on our reservation being mm -hmm. removed from our own culture and traditions. And when I served on the tribal council in 1990, we passed a law that would uh, make them teach the Lakota language in the schools. So it is coming back, but it's a slow thing. And that has happened to us and it happened to Ian's family. So it's not just our Lakota people who, who were deprived and like I said about uh, Ian Sinclair at the Isle of Lewis. I want to tell him about your great great grandfather about how when he signed the treaty, Fort Laramie Treaty. Uh, my great grandfather, Forbear, he signed the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. And he had to live on a certain piece of land that they allocated to him. This was all our treaty land. And what kind of sense does that make to assign your own land to, to what, a native person like my great grandfather? He had to live there and not leave. If he left, he would have, he had to have a signed permit to come and go. Otherwise he would have been shot as a hostile. So his life changed at that time. He could no longer hunt the buffalo for his family, for food and for clothing. And they gave him rations. And I saw a log in the museum at Timberlake where his name was listed as receiving rations. I don't know how often they received them, but our diet changed at that time. So today we have diabetes in epidemic proportions. And it was recorded 1919 the first case of diabetes among our people. So our whole life has changed because of that. That was remarkable insight, Marcella. And I think you touched on those two things, land and language, and the way that there might be a, a, a comparison there, not an equivalence, but some kind of comparison with Gaelic culture. But I think you touched on something else, which you, you're a sort of living example of, and that is the, 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 the problem with disconnecting generations and, and not having an opportunity to learn from elders and from, 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 from parents. And I think especially grandparents, I think that grandparents are really crucial as part of that learning process. And, and what you were talking about there was really that disconnect. And, and, and a, I know from talking to some Gaelic speakers that they would talk about that sense of being sent away and, and then being kind of, as it were, estranged from your, that generation. The, the, the generation of the grandparents. And I think that's a, I mean, Tony Morrison talks about this too, rooted, rootedness, the ancestor as foundation, but also the idea of the grandparents as being a, a carriers of wisdom and culture and memory and heritage and, and, and so on. So I think that was that was a very valuable a, a contribution for which thanks. Is, I, wonder, we... I wonder, Willie, if um, just whilst we're, we're here, I know that um, we have a question from one of our panellists to the panellists. I wonder, Justin, if, if um, you'd like to ask your question to Marcella. Sure. I would love to speak, speak, speak to you for days, Miss Lebeau. Um, but I have a question for you. I was wondering what the return of the shirt meant to your community and what the shirt means to you personally? You know, we, uh, when we were at Glasgow, Scotland, we had to sign a contract that the ghost shirt wouldn't be buried. And we had to put it in a museum that was uh, environmentally controlled so that the ghost shirt would be protected. So the ghost shirt is still at the uh, pier and we're getting ready to, we're thinking about moving it back to Eagle Butte. But my, my thought is that every child that lives on this reservation should have the opportunity to see that ghost shirt and know the story and the stories behind that and what happened to us. And it would be a way of healing for our 
for our whole reservation. And so I'm looking forward to being able to do that. There's and much said, here on our reservation. And here several months ago, there was a man who came and I don't recall his name, but he came as a descendant of, of the foresight, the, I think was a Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah. He came as a relative. He found out that he was related to him and what he had done there at Wounded Knee. And he felt badly about that. And he wanted to come to our tribe and to apologize. So he came once, he was accepted and his, and he wants to come back again and again. So things like that are beginning to happen here. And like I said before, I believe that on our reservation, there is a pervasive sadness that exists because of Wounded Knee. And we have people who are still grieving here and we need to do something to help those people and to alleviate some of that sadness that exists here. And you said that there are plans to put the shirt in a, in a museum there at Cheyenne River? Yes, we do have a museum, but it's, it's not a state of the art museum, but I believe that it's suitable that we can bring the ghost shirt back. And when there's time, I would like to read the, the talk that I gave at Wounded Knee when we brought the ghost shirt back. Well, that will be a future event because we, we we must revisit this this area because it's obviously a story that's still ongoing and 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 that's something that interests me. This is not history; it's living memory. You, you Marcella, are, are are proof of that and of the importance of of still thinking about it. I would like museums to become places where virtual objects could be shown in all their their glory and and glamour, but the real objects that matter to people or back in the community as part of their material culture. So maybe the virtual museum should be about making available objects virtually, which could be returned and restored to the actual items, artifacts to the, the communities. That would be my way of thinking about, because I know the other way of thinking about the virtual museum is that we, we can all visit through our computer screens, items that we can't touch or, 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 or see you know, on, 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 and, and the, the, the flesh as it were, and, and the fabric as it were. So I think that's what you've said about the, 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 the ghost stand shirt. I don't think it has to be a state of the art museum. I think it has to be a state of the heart a, a museum where, where, where the, the, the items are there where they, sh where they should be. As, I, as Mungo Campbell said, the ghost stand shirt should never have came to Scotland. That, that was a wrong that, that, that was rated 21 years ago, but maybe there are still more steps to be taken there. How are we doing now, Cassie? For, for, well, for I'm just saying, we have, oh, firstly, we have two minutes to go. So maybe we have time for what, one more question um, before rounding up, although we're having lots of requests um, to hear um, Marcella's uh, words as they were spoken um, during the, the repatriation ceremony. And yeah, I'd like to hear think, that. Although we, we, we probably don't have time for that now, we'll make sure to um, share yeah. that with, um, with you and with the audience uh, when we can. Um, there's one other question here specifically again to do with an item. Um, um, would, does Marcella, would she like to tell us about rain in the face and his waistcoat? Um, and its uh, its importance to to her. Talk about rain in the faces. Beaded vest, waistcoat. The the beaded vest that they say belonged to my great grandfather, rain in the face. That is over in the museum in Glasgow, Scotland. And they are unable to prove that it belongs to rain in the face. And we haven't been able to prove that belongs to rain in the face. So what I'm asking them to do now is to take the name off that vest. And it's, it's a Lakota beaded vest, so that's obvious, but we can't prove that it belongs to rain in the face. So I'm asking that they remove the name from, from that vest 
they're they're not willing to give it back to us because we can't prove prove that it belonged to him. So that's the status of the vest that's over there in Glasgow Museum. I would also like to say Pat Allen is working on, she's already done it, she's already removed the name, but she's also working on finding a way that we can get it back over here. So if there's anybody else interested that would would be able to help us find a way, then we would greatly appreciate it. Um, can I quickly say something as Pat Allen, because this is important. Hi, Marcella. Um, relating to this, we just, we are changing our whole approach. I work for Glasgow Museums. I'm the curator responsible for these collections. And uh, we're, we're changing, you know, so my feeling is exactly, you know, the, these, these negotiations should be community led and whatever happens, whatever the decision is, is once it leaves our hands, it's up to whoever rightfully owns the objects to, to do what they will with them. You know, in, in Aberdeen, uh, they returned a sacred bundle, which was, and it was used in a ceremony and now no longer exists. You know, so this is what I feel is the right thing. In terms of rain in the face or the waistcoat, um, if you go onto our website, I, I've, I, according to Marcella's wishes, I have removed the name of rain in the face in the title. I brought it back in and I've written quite a lot in which I'm suggesting that we haven't found evidence yet. What all we need is some way of linking rain in the face to either George Crager or Buffalo Bill or even rain in the face wearing a waistcoat because it's so and there's so many photographs coming to light all the time. So my, my request is if you find anything, any of these three th things, rain in the face with Crager, with Buffalo Bill or just wearing a waistcoat, he does seem to favour long sleeved jackets in his photos but send them to me so then I can I can get this moving and the waistcoat can go back please yeah I mean it's not you know we don't need much I still think you know it should go back but um we have to we don't own the collections Glasgow Museums does not own its collections the collections are owned by the people of Glasgow and the decisions the ultimate decision is are made by the councillors and the meeting I had about a different repatriation yesterday, the first question I was asked, or well, the third question actually, the first one was, what is repatriation? Where is this particularly um, interesting place in Africa, beginning with B, that we're not, I'm not allowed to talk about? And um, when, uh, isn't this going to open the floodgates? So 20 odd years later, that question is still being asked. So I have to convince the council you know, that this is not going to cost them any money, that the floodgates aren't going to open. And if you don't know the answers to those first two of those questions, why do you care anyway? You know, if you're not really interested and there are people who deeply feel and are and are the rightful owners, just give them back and, not, and just make it, you know, quick and easy and painless for everybody. So that's all I have to say. And I'm sorry I bust, butted in like that, but I felt I had to say something. No, that was brilliant. That was wonderful. Just perfect. I've got a photograph on, on my desktop that Tom Cunningham gave me of, of the, the Craiger family with the, the waistcoat. With the waistcoat, yeah. Sorry. So that, but I, th I agree with you entirely. But I think part of the problem is that the people of Glasgow are not well enough informed about the cultural artefacts that are held in their city. So hopefully this event is the beginning of no. a greater awareness and understanding of what's in our museums and how we should have those museums and the fact that we can have the objects virtually and as part of an education well, program. We and do in the Turn to the Ghost Dance shirt that Marcella made. Exactly. So you, could, you could start, everybody could start by going to museums. So that's, you know, <laughs> the only plug. But, um, you know, there are lots of ways of, so not everybody wants what were once sacred art, uh, uh, material, objects, materials back. We don't, um, and so we need, we, I try and accommodate that as well. There's lots of ways, it's very complicated, but you know, in every, every case, every community, every relationship is different. 
So, um, you know, we have, a, we have a sacred space where we put human remains and sacred objects, and they're kind of like a waiting room in a sense. And then, you know, some people want, are happy with a digital version. I mean, if they're, if they, some, some objects are a weird shape or too big, or, you know, we have things, these two posts from, uh, called Zogo Bar from the Pacific Islands of Torres Strait, and they're three meters tall. So the community don't really want them back because their own community centre is only two metres high. Well, that, that might be the case in some, for some items, but obviously in general, it's, just, it's better if museums use the technology so that they can return the artefacts. Only if the people want the art, them back. You know, yeah, obviously yeah. Marcella and the Lakota people, you know, and other people want things. It's everybody, you get, you know, it's whatever they want and to do with as they will afterwards, but not everybody... It's, you know, wants things to be thrown at them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's obvious ones like, okay, Benin. Um, and the turtle, the, the, the Torres Strait Islanders wanted high resolution photographs. So it's like, an, um, so and they're still theirs as far as I'm concerned. We look after them according to the way they wish it. And, and then they, so they wanted these high resolution photographs for a, a, an exhibition. And I can't, and in fact, what they wanted, they decided to do is to make, to, to make tiny models mm -hmm. to sell in, in, you know, as at the exhibition, um, which is fine by me as well. I don't mind. I don't think it's up to me or us or anybody. If you take, if, the, if something shouldn't be in a museum and there are rightful owners who want them back or want something done with them, their wishes are paramount because they're not ours. Yeah. I agree. Okay, can I stop talking now? Sorry. Sorry, yeah. I butted in everybody. <laughs> well, that was excellent. And we, we, we should go to museums more and, 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 and learn more about what, what is there and how it came to be there. So Cassie, where are we now in terms of... I think it's probably time to wrap up, I'm afraid. We, um, we've gone past our, our half seven mark, but I wonder if there's anything um, that any of the panellists would like to, to say to, to round off as a... An, an open invitation for any any final words. Say your prayer. Yeah. Marcella would like to say something. Fantastic. I would I would like to read the talk that I gave at the Wounded Knee Grave site when we brought the gold shirt back. It's but not that long. Anyway, uh, I have a a DVD here, but I'll have Jerry send that on the. I'll have her send it to you. It's about the uh, Paiute lady. But I'll, I'll read what I said at Wounded Knee when we brought the ghost shirt there. This is August 1st, 1999. I shake your hand with a good heart. We stand here today on hallowed ground. Our Lakota ancestors lie here in this mass grave. They were innocent men, women, and children who were massacred under a white flag of truce on December 29, 1890. The sacred ghost and church is making a full circle today, returning from whence it came. The Lakota spirit was broken here that fateful day. This is historic for us to come together here on this hallowed ground to witness the return of the sacred ghost and church. We give our heartfelt gratitude to our friends from the Kelvin Grove Museum, Glasgow, Scotland, the people of Glasgow, Scotland, the, and many others who made this possible. Lila Wopila Tanka, it is a great Thanksgiving. This will bring about a sense of closure to a sad and horrible massacre in the history of the Lakota nation. Now healing can begin. Gratitude goes out to Mario Gonzalez, a champion in this effort, John Earl, Alan Duke, Ian Sinclair, and many others who supported us overwhelmingly. My family, Diane, Richard, Tom, Jerry, Kathy, Donna, and my grandchildren are all descendants of the Wounded Knee Massacre. 
My son Richard traveled with me in 1998 to Glasgow, Scotland and stands by my side. Our youth must look, must know our history and not forget. Our lives are affected by broken treaties, land loss, poverty, unemployment, alcoholism, and all the associated ills and dysfunction. We have within ourselves the power to change. We look for healing. We look to our youth, the seventh generation, to, ri to rise up with vision, cast us out despair, build self-esteem, and combat the ills of our society so that the spirit can soar once again. Thank you for that, Marcella. That was beautiful. And, and, and I, I think I've, I've certainly learned a lot and I've loved listening and, and, and learning from, from, from you. And I, and I hope the conversation can continue. And, and, and one thing that the technology allows for is closing down some of the distances across years and, 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 and miles between us. So hopefully that we can build on this. There'll certainly be a legacy document and it'd be great to have your, 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 your speech included as as part of that and, and, and we'll be in touch about the, 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 the next steps and, and we'll do what we can uh, uh, to get that waistcoat and, and any other items, send, send the list over and, and we'll see what we can be done. I've got some friends in Glasgow that might be able to help. So Cassie, do you want to draw a thing? I'd, I'd also like to mention Lisa Kelly, Dr. Lisa Kelly in Film and Television Studies is one of my, is, is the unseen co-curator of this event as well as Cassie, who was really, 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 in many ways, the, 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 the brains and, and, and organization behind it. But Lisa Kelly, who's been doing some of the work with the clips in the chat, was my, my co-organizer for, 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 for this event. We started off with Outlander, and I'm so pleased that we, 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 we got to something that's much more meaningful and interesting, but that's what things like Outlander can do. They can act as prompts and, and, and triggers to, to, to produce more interesting material. Super, thank you so much, Willie, and thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. What a uh, moving and valuable and timely conversation this is. So let's, um, let's keep it going um, after this session. We'll be in touch um, tomorrow with some further links, um, a link to a feedback form. Um, please do share your reflections. It really helps us to be able to continue the conversation. And we will also let you know when we have a, a beautiful uh, short film inspired by these conversations and these interviews that we've been having um, available uh, as, a, as a legacy of, of tonight as well. So for now, I'll say thank you very much um, and good night.